Hello, my name's Paul McIntyre. And I'm Andy Hawes, and we're both instructors at the National Driving Centre. We're here to show you this short film on our Category C Module 4 CPC. Throughout the season, we're going to be showing you some more films, so if you like this one, please hit that subscribe button and come and see what we do. We're going to run through some of the questions and answers that you'll be asked on your Module 4 CPC. Now, we're not just going to do this as a Q&A basis. We're going to give a little bit more information here to help back up why we're doing these things in a certain way. So, Paul, how could we load the vehicle? So, loading this vehicle, first of all, we'll begin at the front. So, we're going to start at the bulkhead, working our way back, putting our heavy items to the bottom and lighter items to the top. So where do we do that? So, starting at the bulkhead, obviously, in the event of heavy braking, so thinking about if we hit those brakes suddenly, if that load was here, all of that load is going to go forward. So, that's why we're starting at the bulkhead and then working our way back. So, that front... Uh, goods are going to help brace the rest of the load as well. Okay. Once we started at the front and working our way back, we're then going to make sure we're evenly distributed over the width, making sure the vehicle isn't leaning to one side. And we can do that as a visual check from the rear of the vehicle. We're going to make sure this load is secured, uh, making sure it's not um, going to move around, so it's not going to endanger us or anyone else. You could have a look at our straps and chains video. We'll put the link down in the description here to help you uh, with those chains and straps. So making sure it's, not sec it's secured, it's not going to move around, and then making sure we're not overloading any axles. That examiner's going to ask you, where would you find these axle weights? So that's where we could look into our vehicle now, and we're going to have a little look, opening the door, and we have our VOSA plate. Okay, this VOSA plate is going to give us our maximum weights and maximum axle weights. Now, on this vehicle, it's found on the passenger door here, but normally around the kick panel or somewhere in the cab, and that's going to give us our, our maximum weights. How can we tell if it's overloaded? So visual checks that could tell us this vehicle was overloaded, well, looking at the rear suspension here, if we looked and we saw that the rain and spray suppression equipment was touching the tyre, that would be a good indication. Or if the rain and spray was touching the, the ground itself, that would be another indication. Also, we've got twin wheels here. So if those twin wheels were touching, a big indication that these, uh, these vehicle is grossly overloaded. We can also look for our paperwork for our load to give us that indication of what it weighs. Okay, so we could look at our paperwork, our load docket. Um, we could look at our, our load itself. So normally the load has it written on. What does it weigh? Or if one, we're, we're unsure of this load, we could take it to a weigh bridge and get it weighed. Our next question we could get possibly from the examiner is, if our vehicle was over three meters tall, care should be taken when entering what? So I'm going to put Andy on the spot now. And Andy, if our vehicle was over three meters tall, care should be taken when entering what? So we've got loading bays, freight terminals, road tunnels, level crossings, yep. overhead cables, pipelines, overhead canopies, petrol stations, bridges. Excellent work, excellent work. So we're just trying to rattle off a few for the examiner. If you can rattle off that many, absolutely outstanding. Well done. Um, so our last one was bridges there. So our next question could be, if we were to connect with a, a bridge, what information do we give to the authorities? Well, obviously we need to let them know what the damage is, the bridge location and the bridge reference number. Excellent stuff. Thank you very much. Paul, oh, where can we find the centre of gravity? Okay, so with centre of gravity, we need to put a little bit of an explanation into this one. So, obviously, we're going to take, say two answers here. We're going to say unloaded and loaded. Because what we're going to explain to the examiner here, that where we position our load is grossly going to affect how this vehicle handles. So, unloaded, the centre of gravity is just roughly forward of centre. Okay, we've got engine and gearbox at the front. Um, so, unloaded, just forward of centre. Now, we're then going to say with the vehicle loaded, it could be anywhere between here and here, depending on where I position my load. So we're trying to get that point across to the examiner that if I was to position my load at the front of the vehicle, that's going to make obviously the front axle very heavy, the rear axle potentially light, and that could affect the drive of the system. Um, obviously, 
as equalizing to that. We, if our load was at the back of the vehicle, that's going to make our front axle very uh, light and our rear axle very heavy, which then could affect our steering and obviously emergency braking. So to recap that one, unloaded roughly about here, loaded anywhere between here and here, depending on where I position my load. So the next question we could potentially get from that examiner is driving in extremely hot or cold conditions. So to try and keep this uh, video under an hour, we're gonna try and answer this um, uh, together. So hot and cold, but this will very often be asked as a separate question. So Andy, if we were gonna be driving in extremely hot or cold conditions, what checks or changes would we do to this vehicle? Okay, so first off, we're gonna start off with all our visual aids. Now obviously this encompasses both hot and cold conditions. Make sure the windscreen is nice and clear, not damaged, not cracked or broken in any way. Check our wiper blades. Obviously, they split. Make sure they're in good working order. And coupled with that is our screen wash. Make sure it's topped up correctly. Check all our mirrors. Check all our lights. And obviously, the number plate. Make sure it's clean, clear and easily read. Then I'm going to carry on and walk around the side of the vehicle. Andy, why would you walk around the vehicle to answer this question? It makes it easier. Make sure we don't forget anything on this, okay? So, mirrors, again, make sure they're nice and secure. They're not damaged or cracked or broken in any way. Moving along to our tires now, okay? Make sure we've got good tread. Make sure they're correctly inflated for whatever conditions we're gonna be driving in. Moving along, again, still checking all our lights. And then for the case of extreme hot conditions, we wanna check our air intake, okay? Make sure it's not, clogged up with dust, sand, anything like that. It affects the running of the engine. Moving along, we're gonna check still all our lights until we get to the rear tires, okay? And again, make sure they've got good treads and they're correctly inflated. Moving around the vehicle, till we come to the back, and again, we're gonna check all our lights again. Make sure that they're not damaged or broken in any way. Top marker lights, Rear number plate, make sure it's clean, clear, and easily read. Carrying on down the other side of the vehicle. So again, we'd repeat the process. All our tires, all our lights. Working our way up to the fuel tank. Fuel tank's really important, especially in extreme cold conditions. We wanna make sure that the fuel lines aren't frozen, and if we need to, we can add the uh, anti-waxing additive. Okay, stops it solidifying. Check the batteries make sure the terminals are good and they're nice and secure. We could drain the air tanks, okay? And then also we want to check that our air conditioning is working, our heat is working and our windows open and close. When you say drain the air tanks, drain it of what? So what we're looking at there is any moisture that's in the tank. Make sure we drain that moisture away because obviously that will freeze in extreme cold conditions. Okay, so the next question the examiner could ask you is what the main difference is between driving a laden and an unladen vehicle, or a large vehicle and a small vehicle. So Paul, go on. what's the difference then between driving a larger vehicle that's laden or an unladen vehicle? So, well, behind me here, we've got our, our little C1 vehicle, our little seven and a half ton vehicle. So obviously driving this vehicle loaded or unloaded, well, unloaded, you're gonna have, you know, a lot more uh, speed to pull away from junctions and bits and pieces like that. Loaded, yes, you're going to feel that when you drive away, but being a seven and a half ton vehicle, it's not going to be as much. If we moved on to the C plus E, you know, we have a potential axle weights here of going up towards 44 ton. So pulling away from a junction or a roundabout in this vehicle is going to be extremely more challenging, okay? Especially pulling out of that roundabout, there's lots of people coming towards us and we're trying to pull away. You hit the throttle, and nothing happens for about five seconds. So we're trying to, we're, we're judging that uh, forward planning a lot more here. So the power needed to pull away is a lot more. You know, alternatively from that, the power needed to stop, trying to stop this vehicle, okay, with that amount of weight, is gonna take a lot more energy. So that's gonna affect us a lot more. So that what forward planning. We, what about when we corner? So well, corner, you, absolutely. So you're gonna have that body roll. So remember from our theories, we had fluid tanks, okay, that's gonna affect when we go around, so we have baffle plates to help reduce that. But if we had maybe swinging meat in the side of it, that's when you're gonna get that pendulum effect. And obviously cornering there, that's more likely when the vehicle is gonna overturn. 
So the next question we could receive from that uh, examiner is how can we stop criminal activity around this vehicle, i.e. how can we stop the contents or the vehicle being stolen. So the first thing I'm going to do when I leave my vehicle is making sure I lock the vehicle, making sure no one can gain access. I could also fit an alarm to the vehicle to help stop that uh, vehicle or its contents being stolen. What we could also do, any personal equipment like mobile phones, laptops, make sure they're hidden away. Don't want anybody seeing those. What we could then do is, as we're walking around, check in our cargo doors. Make sure that we've got padlocks fitted, we've got the keys, and when we're parking at night especially, make sure we're backed up to either a wall or another vehicle. Good stuff. As I get to the rear of the vehicle, again, making sure my back doors are locked, okay, making sure I have anti-tamper devices fitted, especially if this is from a depot. If this was a curtain-sided vehicle, I'll make sure my metal uh, lead is going around the vehicle, and again, making sure that's uh, secured and padlocked accordingly. What we could also do, Paul, is we get pulled over. So if we get stopped by police or VOSA, we can check, one, their ID, so we know who they are. And if we need to, we can also make a call to the local police uh, station or the VOSA office to make sure they've got operatives in that area. I'm going to make sure that we don't uh, pick up any hitchhikers, uh, making sure I don't discuss my load down the pub or anything like that, and making sure I vary my routes, I don't uh, keep to the same routes all the time. I'm going to adjust my routes uh, accordingly so I don't become a, a creature of habit. Oh, as what, why do we have a locking fuel tank? So obviously the fuel is very expensive on these vehicles and sometimes these tanks can hold you know, vast quantities. You know, Some Arctics can hold anywhere up to 500 to 600 litres of diesel and this becomes very expensive to replace. So we have a locking fuel cap to make sure that anti-tamper side of things is uh, reduced. What other things can we do? Um, so, i.e., we could make sure we're parked in well-lit yeah. lay-bys. Yeah. Um, we use proper truck stops. Mm -hmm. um, make sure we park in secure locations. So, another question the examiner could ask you is how do you know this vehicle does the proper safety checks? So, Paul, how are we going to find out if it's had the proper safety checks? Well, first of all, I'm going to check my maintenance records, my service records, making sure the service schedules are all up to date. I'm going to make sure uh, my pre-operational checks are carried out, you know, in the morning or at the start of the shift, making sure any faults are recorded and making sure this is in collaboration with your safe systems of work uh, detailed by your boss or employer. So making sure we do our daily walk arounds, which we'll cover in a little bit, uh, and making sure there's no leaks on the vehicle and obviously all the paperwork is up to scratch. The next question we could get from that examiner is we're going to be familiarising ourselves with the dimensions and restrictions with these vehicles. So let's imagine Andy we've turned up to depot in our category C vehicle but now I'm going to put you out in our C plus E vehicle. So what checks would you do before you drive off down the road? Okay so first thing I check is the height. The height, the length, the width. Okay. I also need to know what load I'm carrying because obviously that will have an effect on where we can or cannot go. We need to check that we've got enough fuel and a means to pay for that fuel as well for said vehicle. The very last thing you want to be doing is driving down the road up to that small bridge and you're already imagining, what's the height of the vehicle? Incredibly embarrassing, so make sure you get these numbers and these, all these calculations before you drive off down that road. Andy, let's talk drugs and illegal immigrants. I thought you'd never ask, Paul. So where would we search this vehicle for drugs and illegal immigrants? Okay, so first off what I do is as I'm approaching the vehicle, I want to look on top and underneath. If I can't quite see on top, then I'll get to an elevated position, something like the ramps over there. And what would you be looking for on top? So anybody laid down, anything laid on top, anything we can't quite see from down here. Gotcha. What I then do is I'll move to the cab area. So I'll open the door. While I'm here, I'm going to check around the door frame, all the way around, and check my door cards. Make sure they've not been tampered with. What we're looking for is anything that we can prise open, unscrew, unbolt. When I'm happy with all that, check the seat. Make sure it's not being cut, anything placed inside, do that, bottom and back. Check around the seat area. Check underneath in the footwell, so all around the pedals and the steering column, making sure nothing's been prized open, unbolted, unscrewed. When I'm happy with that, I'll get in the cab.
What I'm going to do now is check the cab area. So I'm looking at my dash, all the buttons, any little cubby holes, where the tacos are, the radio, anywhere that I can reach. My headlining, my lights, the dash. Okay, at this point, what I'll also do is just turn the ignition on. What I'm looking for now is that my dash lights work. Okay, it could be an indication that something's not quite right. So now what I wanna make sure I do is turn all my lights on. So that includes your fog lights and your hazard lights. Now I'm gonna step out of the vehicle and we'll do the external check. So now what I'm gonna look at is the wheel arch. So I'm gonna have a good look around the wheel arch, down the side of the engine, even check the wheels themselves. Make sure nothing's been tampered with, anything we can place our hand and fit inside. Moving along, I'll check behind the cab area, if I can see it into the uh, air deflector at the top. Moving along, check the bodywork, any body panels, and again, underneath, in and around the exhaust, even the air filter. Check my add blue. Here, we can take the cap off. And what we're looking for now is any string or wire. Anything placed down the neck of the bottles. Moving along, checking my side impact bars. The chassis, the lights, then again, the rear wheel. Have a good look around the wheel arch and in between the wheels. Even check stuff like the hub. Look for any oil, anything like that that shouldn't be there. Coming along, Again, checking underneath, looking at the chassis, looking at the floor, checking my lights. Come here, checking the lights, hence why we turn the lights on. Now that we can see if there's anything placed inside the light, we'll see a dark shadow. Make sure our doors are secure. Check our number plate and any external cameras and lights. Moving around this side of the vehicle, again, we're gonna check all our body panels, the lights, the chassis, coming again to the rear wheel arch, have a good look around the wheel arch, and in between the tires and the wheels. Working away along the uh, side impact bars, the chassis, and again, the fuel tank. Now remember what I said on the ad blue, here we can take the cap off, looking for any string or wire, anything that's attached and placed inside the neck of the, bottle, uh, the uh, tank. Check in and around the batteries, you can lift the cover up, check down the side, in between, on top and underneath the batteries. Moving along, again, this side of the cab now. Checking all our air deflectors and the wheel arch along the side of the engine. Here, again, we can check our mirrors, making sure they've not been tampered with or prized open in any way. Open up the passenger door now. Same as we did the other side. Check the door frame, Check the door card, make sure it's nice and secure, it's not been tampered with. Here we can check the seats again, making sure nothing's been placed inside or underneath the seats. Have a good look anywhere we can open up. Fuse boards, anything like that. Once we're happy with that, then we'll shut the door up again. Now we're gonna move around the front. This time, we're gonna check our wiper arms, Make sure nothing's been taped up or placed inside. Do that both sides. Here we can look along the front of the dash as well. If we can't quite see it inside the cab, now's a good time to look. Checking any other mirrors, checking our lights, body panels, and number plate. Here, we'll open up the front now. What we're looking at now is anywhere we can place our hands, anywhere we can hide anything. So we check around, open the caps up, check our screen wash, coolant, have a look. It's clear we can see in there. Once we're happy with that, that's our security search done. So Andy, we've checked this vehicle top to bottom. We are happy there are no drugs or illegal immigrants on this vehicle. What other checks would I do before returning to this country? So now what we need to do is just check our paperwork for both us, the load and the vehicle. Outstanding. Okay, so next up, it's all about fire. Paul, 
where can a fire start on this vehicle? So where can the fire start on this vehicle? Well, the easiest thing to do with this is walk around the vehicle. Don't try and stand still. It's a very difficult question to answer if you stand still. So with this question, similar to the drugs and illegal immigrants, there isn't a wrong answer. There isn't a wrong answer. So we're just going to walk around the vehicle and point at these specific places where we generate a lot of heat and where that fire could start. So first of all, around the wheels and tires, obviously with the braking system on these large vehicles, a lot of heat is generated around these uh, wheels and tires. So a very common place for fires to start. We've then got our exhaust system. Again, a lot of heat being generated here, and especially with these new generation exhaust systems, a lot of heat can start and a lot of fires with the uh, carbon buildup. As we walk down the vehicle, we've got some more wheels and tires. And again, with twin tires here, if we had a deflation on the, either the inner or the outer, that tire could then get extremely hot. And again, more fires could start. Inside the load itself, we get a lot of fires You know, inside the load. It depends what we're carrying, but this could happen. As we walk around the vehicle, again, no wrong answer. Well, around the lights and lenses, again, we could get a short circuit or open circuit inside the lenses. And again, this could cause fires or extreme heat. As we continue to walk around, that vehicle we've got more wheels and tires so again this is the reason uh, a daily walk around is so important making sure we've got uh, our correct pressures and bits and pieces like that. So extreme heat, so another place that fire could start. As we come down the side of the vehicle, we've got our fuel cell itself. We store a lot of fuel on these vehicles and obviously, you know, we could have leaks and then this could start fires as well. We've got our batteries. So electrical fires could start uh, around in and around our batteries. And again, in around the front tires and around the transmission or engine side of things. As we open the uh, cab door, we've then got a lot of our fuses and electrical systems as well as radios, CVs, and different pieces of equipment inside, obviously day heaters, uh, night heaters, and kettles and kitchen facilities. So again, really common places for these fires to start. So a good inspection of the vehicle to prevent this happening. Okay, Paul, so we're driving down the road and we've got a fire. What are we gonna do? Well, first of all, Andy, I'm gonna remain calm. Okay, make it so I stay chilled out for this exercise, okay? So first of all, I'm gonna pull over in a safe and convenient place, making sure I extinguish my engine and electrical isolator. Now this sounds like a big button, a big brake glass press button. Just turn the key off, okay? This is gonna extinguish our electrical devices and kill obviously our fuel system. Once I've done that, I'm gonna warn other road users. This could be means of putting my uh, hazard lights on okay then I'm going to exit the vehicle and call the emergency services okay don't expect anyone to do it for you I'm going to then give them as much information as I possibly can so my location uh, where I where I am on the road positioning. Obviously, if we're on a motorway I'll use that emergency phone because this is going to give them the majority of this uh, information. Once I've done that, I'm gonna then attempt to tackle the fire if safe to do so. Obviously, if it's a small little fire, I might have a little bash at this. If it's really taking over the whole vehicle, I'm gonna stay away from this vehicle. I am not gonna have a go at this one. So I'm gonna keep uh, other people away from the vehicle and wait for those emergency services to turn up. So what fire extinguishers could we use? Well, if it was, um, let's say a fuel fire, okay, I can't put water on that fuel fire. So what I'm gonna be using would be uh, dry powder or CO2 carbon dioxide. If it was, let's say, an electrical fire around the batteries or inside the cab, again, we don't wanna be using our uh, water fire extinguisher. So in that case, again, CO2 or dry powder would be the extinguisher to use. Hey, how you doing? Let's talk cockpit drill. Remember, when entering or leaving the vehicle, three points of contact. So what we're gonna do now, okay, imagine that we've had a little bit of a break. We're gonna do what we call a cockpit drill. This is just where we make sure everything's good and dandy in the cab. First thing we're gonna do is set the handbrake, make sure the vehicle's in neutral, adjust our seats and adjust our mirrors at this point. We also wanna check the vehicle dimensions. So that's the height, the length, the width, type of load we're carrying, make sure we've got enough fuel for the journey and make sure we've got a means to pay for that fuel if we require any more on the way. We also need to make sure we turn our mobile phones off, okay, and keep them tucked away outside. What we're gonna do then is turn the ignition on. We're looking for our dash warning lights. We won't start the vehicle up until those dash lights have gone out. Once they've gone out, we'll start her up and build that air pressure up as well. We also want to check the horn, check the washers and wipers, make sure that they're all good to go. Remember, 
don't leave with any warning lights on. So the next question we could get is our daily walk around check. So this is gonna be a walk around check of the vehicle, inspecting certain pieces of equipment and making sure they're all operating correctly. Why do we do that, Paul? Well, it's gonna be one of the questions that is asked as part of the module four test. And it's normally at the end of the test this is gonna be done. So definitely a practical demonstration um, of knowing these uh, vehicle components, knowing each and uh, how they work, what they do, and making sure that we're ready to take the vehicle out. Obviously also done as a pre-operational check, and we could have paperwork to fill out depending on what company you intend to work for. Now, don't forget, Paul, you can use the card. Outstanding, thank you, Andy. Um, so yeah, you can use this card and you know, very a helpful guide here. And we're just gonna work our way through the list. So as we work through the list, we're just gonna keep checking ourselves, making sure we know each piece of equipment. So we're gonna start at the top of the list and we're gonna start inside the cab. So I'm gonna jump inside the cab, step inside the cab with three points of contact. So as we enter the vehicle now, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna be checking our dash lights, okay? All this is gonna be involved with is just turning my ignition on, uh, the warning lights will come on and then extinguish, making sure, again, no warning lights remain on throughout the drive. Then we're gonna check our braking system, okay? Quite an in-depth question, this one, and quite, quite, quite a, uh, a lot of information to do here. So first of all, we're gonna start, uh, turn the ignition on, as the ignition comes on, we're then gonna waste our tank. So this means pumping the foot brake and getting rid of all that air. So that all that air will come down. Then the air, warning air system will come on and it tells us you haven't got any air, don't drive off. So now I've done two checks. I've made sure that warning system is working. Now I'm gonna start the vehicle and build up those air tanks again. So now that air pressure is slowly building up and we're increasing that air, air pressure. Then I'm gonna turn the vehicle off, <clears throat> and in a second, I'll walk around listening for any air leaks. So I can carry out the rest of the checks in here so I'm not getting in and out of the vehicle too many times, okay? So the next thing I'm gonna do is check my horn, making sure that's working. I'll check my washers and wipers, making sure they're clean and clear, and uh, cleaning the screen and making sure we've got plenty of fluid. I'm then gonna check my uh, height sign. Remember, for the Road Traffic Act, it must be written in there, how high is the vehicle? And then I'm then gonna check my speed limiter. So how do we know it's got one? Well, it'll be written inside the cab and it must be clearly visible to the driver. How do we know it works? Well, I'll test it on the motorway to make sure that is working. <clears throat> Once we've done that now, I'm then gonna jump out and inspect my mirror. So I'm gonna step out of the vehicle. Again, three points of contact to exit the vehicle. So now inspecting the mirrors, making sure again, clean and clear, free from defect. They're not damaged in any way, making sure everything's doing its job well. Then we come to our tires. So just a standard check on a tire, obviously one mil over three quarters of the radial circumference of the tire, making sure there's no bulges, any cuts, plier, cord explodes, making sure it's inflated to manufacturer's specification. And then I'm gonna check my wheel nuts. Um, now, really, it's a visual check only. So I'm gonna carry out a visual check, making sure if we had wheel nut indicators, they're there, they're doing their job. And if we don't, making sure that the same amount of thread is showing on each one. As we then work around the vehicle, I can then check my exhaust system. Really just a visual check for this one, making sure it's not damaged in any way. It's not obviously dragging along the ground. And as I start the vehicle, there's not excessive smoke or excessive noise coming from the vehicle. Continue to walk around the vehicle, <clears throat> and we're gonna be checking our second tire, making sure again, clean and clear, free from defect, uh, one mil over three quarters of the radial circumference, making sure there's no debris between the two tires. So as we look in between the two tires, there's no rocks, cans of Coke, anything like this at the back of that vehicle. As we continue to come round, we can then inspect our rear doors, making sure they're clean and tidy, locked, making sure we're plated up legally, our lights and lenses, reflectors are there, they're doing their job. Our number plate, again, clean and clear, free from defect, not delaminated or missing. And as we continue to walk around the vehicle, again, more tires, more checks. Keep explaining to the examiner what you're looking for. It's not just a, a quiet test. Make sure you give them all this knowledge that you have about this vehicle. So again, one mil over three quarters of the rail circumference, no bulges, no cuts, ply, cord explodes, making sure everything's doing its job correctly. As we then continue to walk around, again, more tires, more checks, making sure they're clean and tidy. Again, the usual checks to carry out on our tires, wheel nuts as well, 
more mirrors, making sure again, clean and tidy, not damaged in any way. Then we can inspect our wiper blades from the outside. Again, no splits, they're touching the screen fully, making sure again, number plate is clean and clear. <clears throat> Now, once we've done that, we're gonna work through our list. Uh, number plates we've done, operator's license. So normally found in the window. Andy, what would I check on my operator's license? Well, it's in date and it matches the vehicle that it's displayed for. Excellent stuff. Obviously, we need to be checking that this vehicle has tax and MOT. Now, we don't display tax anymore, so how could I ensure that this vehicle is taxed and MOT'd? Well, again, we can go onto the uh, DBLA website and have a look. It will tell us on there where it's tax and MOT. But we can also check in the office, check with your, your manager, your transport manager. Excellent stuff. So now that one's done. I've done my tyres, I've done my wheel, wheel nuts. Um, air leaks, as we walk around the vehicle, we're going to inspect for any air leaks. Now, this is where we'll explain to the examiner where we're listening to. So we'll listen around the wheels and tyres, not because we're listening to the tyre, but because this is where the braking system is and that's where that air is going to be used. As we continue around the vehicle, around the chassis, because our air lines are down by the chassis, so this is another good place to listen to around the rear suspension units. A lot of these vehicles have air suspension, so we need to be listening to the rear bellows, making sure, again, there's no hissing um, that might be coming from these air tanks, okay? Once we've checked that, again, down the other side, making sure everything is okay, and just we'll keep referring to the list. That's why we've got it in our hands, so just keep referring to it. So again, we'll come down the other side, and now we're just checking our rear suspension again, no hissing, okay? Making sure around the brakes and systems, no hissing air coming from it. Uh, down the chassis, again, no hissing lines. In between the cab and the uh, load, making sure, again, this is the closest you're gonna get really to the uh, compressor. So again, no hissing around that area. Now I need to do a light check. Andy, could you help me carry out a light check on this vehicle? Of course I can. Excellent stuff. So Andy's gonna jump in the vehicle. I'm gonna go to the rear and we'll make sure everything's working. So let's go have a look, make sure everything's working on this vehicle. So Andy's gonna run through the lights. Obviously, ask that examiner to help very normally. They will help you. Sometimes he might say, imagine you're on your own. Okay, well then we'll just do it on our own. Okay, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So, yep, fog lights, lovely. Yep, lovely. Yep, yep. So now we'll continue to check these lights. I'm gonna tap and check, making sure they don't flicker. They're showing the correct light to the correct place. Obviously, don't forget your high sides. Of course, we can't tap these, but we're making sure that examiner sees us, checking these. Our side lights, making sure again they're working, showing the correct light to the correct place. Continue to tap and check, making sure they're not flickering. Indicator right, please, Andy. Thanks so much. Again, making sure they're working. And as we come to the front, Again, another light check, making sure they're working, they're doing their job well. Again, not forgetting our high sides and tapping and checking. They're not damaged in any way. And indicator left, please, Andy. Marvelous stuff. And making sure our audible systems, if fitted, much, must be appro appropriately working, okay? So that's all our main lights. Now, like we said, he might not help you. He might not help you. So in this scenario, Yes, do it yourself, okay? We can walk around tapping and checking, and then how are we gonna check our brake lights? So Andy, if we were on our own, how can we check our brake lights on this vehicle? So, if we're on our own, we can wedge the pedal down, we can use a reflective surface, or in the case of some vehicles, they've even got a little button we can check. Excellent stuff. So with that daily walk around check, use the card. The card is there to help, okay? Don't try and wing it off your head it's not gonna get you any marks by not using this, okay? So use the card to help you, and this is the best way to get through this daily walk around check. Take your time, don't rush it. Thanks for watching, hope this video has helped, okay? This will give you all the information you need to pass your module four. So if you'd like this video, uh, and it's been of some help, please hit the subscribe button and the like, and then moving on, if you'd like us to make any more films, anything that would help you um, with these vehicles, how they work and how they operate, please uh, give us a little comment below and we are here to help. Otherwise, look into our uh, other videos that we've made and please check out our website, which is in the description. Thanks very much.